good morning. morning. So good to see you guys. I just, I want to say thank you. I love you so much um, for being here this morning and what we're doing and and coming together to worship and usher in the presence of God. And hopefully it's a blessing to you to experience God's presence in this place um, and that you take it with you when you go as just a remnant of God's presence and it goes with you wherever you go in whatever area that you uh, go to, whether it's work or home or whatever it is, I just, my prayer is that there would be a bit of Jesus, not just a bit, a lot of Jesus in your life and his presence and that people around you would sense it and be drawn to him uh, through the power of his spirit. And so um, we had an opportunity yesterday to go to uh, a baby shower. Anybody been to a baby shower? (laughs) And this was, it was a really cool baby shower. It was uh, uh, one that uh, I had done the wedding about seven months ago, and uh, turns out she's about seven months pregnant, which was interesting. It was awesome. I was like, okay, good, good uh, honeymoon, I guess. And um, <laughs> so we, uh, anyways, we were there for the, the baby shower and just hanging out. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been to baby shower, but there, it was a couple's baby shower, which is unique in itself. Usually, it's just ladies, but um, there were men there, and um, it was just a lot of fun, a lot of games. A lot of celebration, you know, oh, there's a baby coming and woohoo and yeah, you're going to have a baby is what you've been wanting all your life and stuff. And then the reality kicks in nine months later and you're like, what <laughs> did I get myself into? And so we were trying to prepare her for that and be like, hey, you need to make sure. And they had those cards, right? And you could, you could it says what to, what to tell an expecting mother and you fill it out and put it in a box or whatever. And then she reads them at home. And so we're like, you need Jesus like more than ever. <laughs> Like, like more than ever now because you have um, a little child that you uh, have to take care of. And so um, let's go ahead and pray for our kids and our workers this morning. Father, thank you so much for the kids and, and, uh, that are hanging out in the other room and even the ones in this room. We pray for your blessing and your anointing on them and their leaders and uh, that your word, we know your word says that it will not return void. And so we're praying that in accordance with what your word says that the words that are spoken today uh, from you, that they would remain in their hearts and our hearts as well, and that you'd be honored and glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you should have a program that has notes, and you can take notes. I, I work hard on those, so I hope you get a pen and, and make sure you take notes. And if you want to join us on Thursday nights for our small group at, at my mother-in-law's house, please do. Mike would love to see you there. Um, I'll tell you what, I love it because I, I put those questions on the back, you know, and, and uh, Mike always goes home and he like spends hours, must be, hours researching because he'll show up to our Thursday night group and it's just, he's got a full front and back page of notes ready to, to talk about and, uh, and that's just a blessing, it's always fun to do that. And so, um, so yeah, this morning we're talking about new birth, new life. Uh, this is our, our third week in, or I think it's our third, third or fourth week in the, the Back to Basics series. And, and one of the things I want to talk about this morning is, is this idea of new life and this idea of making disciples, because that's really what that is all about. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, I, there's a book out there called, uh, uh, what is it called? No, not, that is a good book. Not a fan on Friday nights. Love to do that. Um, uh, something about evangelism. Uh, oh man, I can't believe I forgot the name of the book. Um, the Master Plan of Evangelism. I don't know if you've read that. Master Plan of Evangelism. And you read that, and in the church today, we have kind of this division a lot of times. I don't know if you've been around church very much or not, but if you have, there's always this division of like, uh, do we focus on discipleship, right? Teaching and training and growing. Or do we focus on evangelism, which is like reaching new people, people that don't know Jesus. Which do we do? Do we focus on discipleship? Do we focus on evangelism? I'm going to scoop my message right now. And, and it, it comes from this book called The Master Plan of Evangelism, which I wholeheartedly agree with. He basically says there is no distinction between discipleship and evangelism. They are the same thing. Right. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He didn't say go and evangelize, and then once you're done, you know, disciple them. No, no, no. He said, go and make disciples. And so the whole process of discipleship is actually a process of evangelism. I don't know about you, but I did not, like, all of a sudden one day, like, oh, boom, I'm a Christian. Right? It was a process over time 
of me becoming a Christian and becoming, and even to this day, becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, granted, there was a time and a place where I said, you know what? This is like something I really, I really want to give my life to. Like, I really believe this stuff, right? But I mean, I was baptized when I was like seven, right? And then when I was 13, I remember having this moment where I went, I believe this to be real, and I was weeping in an Easter service. I had to leave. I don't know if you remember that, Mom and Dad. I had to leave the Easter service because I was uncontrollably weeping. And then, um, and then it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I went, okay, I want to actually start going to church. And I want to actually start committing. I want to commit my life to following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus. And so it was a process over time. And the same is true for pretty much anyone that you might meet. But it is a much like when you take on the process, you take on the idea of, hey, I'm going to disciple someone, which we're all called to do. I don't know if you knew that or not. I'm going to take someone under my wing and I'm going to teach them about Jesus and how to follow Jesus. When you make that decision, it's much like having a baby. Like, you don't really know what you're getting into. You, you really don't. And I will tell you this. Um, I've said this before, and I don't want to offend anyone if you've never had kids or not, but I just want you to know, I don't think it's, it's really, you can really understand, at least to the fullest nature uh, that parents do, I don't think you can understand the heart of God until you have kids or, or have, have like nieces and nephews that you adopt or that you, you consider your own or even like, like little dogs like Joey. He's, he's your baby, right? And, and you love him unconditionally or her. You love her unconditionally, even when she pees on the carpet, right? Even when she chews up your favorite book, which I don't know what's going on in our house, but I have two dogs, and all of a sudden they've decided they love books, and they've been eating books in my house, literally. And so I don't know what the deal is with that, but I still love them, and I still want to care for them and, and take care of them and shepherd them and, and, and literally disciple them. I train them. Um, and so... Yeah, but when you've never had kids before, like, and, you, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, the idea of having kids is so beautiful, and then, and then you have kids, like, you don't know what you're in for. In fact, I have a couple of slides, I think. Um, yeah, it's all fun and games until you have to wake up and be a parent at 6 a.m. Yeah. Right? Have you ever experienced that? Yeah. Some of you have, or if you have puppies or dogs, or you wake up at 6 a.m. and then you still have to, yeah, okay. Uh, the next one, being dad. <laughs> That's kind of gross. I saw that and I was like, should I put that? I don't know. It's kind of... It is life, right? I don't think that's sweat. I don't think it is. Being dad, it says dedicated to dad. Hood. Dadhood. The next one. How I pictured parenting. She's like, ah. And then the actual parenting. Ah. That's the reality, right? For reals. And I think there's one more. Yeah, that's me. That's that's Noah. That's my side of the bed. That's my pillow. And that was actually that was this morning when I left. <laughs> that's Noah. And that's it. I mean, five o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. I'm scared, or I this, or I that, and you're like, oh, I gotta go to work in a few hours. You don't really understand what it's like to be to to have got the love of God until you have kids like that. So I remember um, Joshua as a baby. Where is Joshua? There he is back there. And I remember when he was a baby and we first brought him home, I mean, first of all, I remember being scared to death driving on the freeway, first and foremost. I was like, oh, don't they know I have a baby in the car? And then I got home, and then I remember holding him in my arms and feeding him. And after a while of this routine of feeding him on a regular basis, I, I got to the point where I was like, I just wish he would like feed himself, you know, like I mean, you would figure out ways to like prop a bottle up with a towel or a blanket or whatever so you didn't have to hold the bottle and all that stuff. And then you're like, oh, man. And then he remember he started walking and, and eating him, you know, feeding himself and, and he could hold the bottle and whatnot. And then he was all over the place. And I was like, I wish he would just sit still for a moment. and Let me feed him. You know what I mean? Like you want to go back to that time when they're just babies. Um, and now I wish he'd just stop eating. Period. Just, just stop. Just stop. But you don't understand the heart of God until you have a child or some, something along those natures. Why? Because you have to learn unconditional love. You have to learn what it means to love someone even when they, 
eat you out of house and home, even when they make mistakes, even when they pee on the carpet, even when they eat your books, even when they wake you up at four o'clock in the morning, you have to learn to love them anyways. When they make bad decisions as a teenager, right? When they're not doing what you want them to do, when they're making those horrible decisions about school and work, and you're like, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, but you still love them when they make bad life decisions. Life is about relationships. Everyone say relationship. relationship. Life is about relationships and learning to love one another. And here's the deal. Everything revolves around relationships. And so if we want to grow our faith, this is one of your feelings, if we want to grow our faith, we have to grow our family. If you want to grow your faith, you have to grow your family. You have to grow the people that are around you. The more people that you have around you in life, the quicker you're going to grow, right? Because we grow through trials. We grow through tribulations. We grow through arguments. You ever come out the, the other end of an argument and made up and all of a sudden now you're stronger together, you're better together? Now sometimes that doesn't always work, but if you do it right, you'll come out stronger on the other side. Because this is, this, is, this is biblical. This is the great commandment, right? The greatest commandment. Turn to Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. That's our text today. This is, this is one of those passages that we in the church use a lot. You maybe have heard this before. But this is Jesus' commandment to us as disciples, as followers of God, as followers of Jesus. And he says in verse 22, it's, uh, there's all these Pharisees coming around. He just got done tearing up the temple, right? Turning tables over. It's like the most angry we've ever seen Jesus before. And then all these Pharisees and Sadducees come around him and they're challenging him. They're testing him. They're trying to trick him. And, and this is what one of the Pharisees says. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. Now, Sadducees and Pharisees, Pharisees were higher in rank than the Sadducees usually. And so the Sadducees were first at Jesus and trying to trick him. And Jesus had nothing of it. He, he had the right answer at the right time all the time. And then the, so then the Pharisees are like, all right, our turn. They gather together and, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Note that he says the point of this question is to test him. Jesus it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, or I'm sorry, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law. In other words, what's the most important commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, quoting um, from the Torah, the Ten Commandments, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the greatest, number one, first commandment, the number one. And then he says, you shall also, the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend the law and the prophets. In other words, he's saying, look, there's two commandments, really. And if you look at the commandment, the Ten Commandments, the first four are all about your relationship with God, and the rest are about your relationship with others. And so he's saying, look, there's really not one more important than the other, but if you were to boil them all down into one thing, it would be love God and love your neighbors. That's it. If you do those two things, everything else will fall into place. If you consider others as more important than yourself, you'll be loving others. And you'll also be loving God. Because that's what he's asked you to do. And you're being obedient to him. In the, in the church, as we, um, in seminary and whatnot, they taught us this, this thing. There's three things that we do as a church. And there, if you haven't noticed, that's what we've been going over. Back to basics. Three things that we do as a church. And it's called inward, outward, upward. Everyone say inward, inward. outward, Upward. Okay, and so as a church, we should be doing those three things at least. Inward, outward, upward. And so we should be focusing inward on our personal relationship and our relationship here as a church, as family. How do we build us personally? Outward, we should be focusing on the world around us. How do we, how do we minister to those in and around us? And that's why we're so blessed to have Deborah here with Feed the Flock Ministries, and we're, we're, we're doing our best to help feed those that are in need, to love on the community around us. We do events like barbecues and movie nights and those kinds of things to help be a blessing to the community around us. And then upward is our Sunday morning. We focus on worshiping God and connecting with God in a powerful and meaningful way. And so that's what we as a church 
are focused on. Sunday mornings are all about upward, right? Midweeks all about inward. And then all of our events and in daily life, we're focusing outward. We're hitting all three of those. And those, if, I, you know, Jesus said there's two commandments. I really think there's three commandments. Inward, outward, upward go along with these commandments. Love God, love your neighbors. What do you think the third commandment is? It's not written necessarily in the Ten Commandments, but Jesus gives it to us specifically. There are three great commandments. They are this. Love God, love people, and multiply. Now, maybe you haven't heard that one before, but multiply and multiplication is a command from God. Look, if you skip over just a few chapters, Matthew 28, so flip your Bible over, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, and Jesus has just been risen from the dead. It's basically his last words to the disciples, and he gives them a commandment, or some of us know it as the Great Commission. We just saw the two great commandments. This is the Great Commission, which I would, I would argue is actually a command as well. What does he say? He says, now the, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. That's a whole other sermon. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, everyone say go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the third commandment. In reality, this is the first commandment. And I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. But this third commandment or first commandment, however you want to look at it, um, we call the Great Commission. The word go really means as you are going, as you are doing life, make disciples. The second is the command. Make disciples. In other words, teach them. The Greek word here is mathetua, tuo, mathetuo. Shows how well my Greek is. Which means to teach, disciple, or make a disciple. To teach someone to follow on the precepts and instructions of someone else. We are called to teach others, to lead others, to multiply ourselves. It goes back to the great commandment, love God and love others. The great commission is not really a third commandment, it's the same as the greatest commandment, love God and love others by making them disciples. If we love them, we'll want them to know God. And if we love them and want them to know God, they'll want to be like God, which means they'll want to be like us as we're trying to be like God. And so it's just a natural thing. And guess what? The world desperately needs it. Did you realize that over 60% of this community right here 60% of this community are what we call nuns. No, they're not Catholic nuns. They basically, when you give them a survey, they say, what religion are you? They would put none. 60%. That's a lot. What is that? If there's 60,000 people in the surrounding area right here, in La Mesa and San Carlos area, what's 60% of 60? What is it? 36,000 people in this area need to know Jesus. Probably more because the rest are maybe put, checked Christian, but they're not Christian, or they check Muslim, or they check something else. So it's really more than that. That's a lot of people that need to be reached for Jesus. And you might say, oh, but Eric, I'm not good at this whole Bible thing. Like, I don't really know what to tell people or how to disciple people. Let me ask you this. Those of you that are parents in the room, did you ever get any training on how to be a parent? <laughs> you did? So, so Stacy and I, like our background, if you know, we went to school to be teachers. And so they taught us how to work with kids. Like I have a degree and a, and a, and a teaching credential, and Stacy has a degree in child development, and we have four kids. And I'll tell you what, when we had our first one, I was like, I have no idea what to do. Yep. And I think about this all the time. I think, man, if we had all that training, right, we're professionals, what about people that have none? How do they do it? How do they figure it out? That's it. They just figure it out. They do life together. They just do life and say, well, this is how I'm doing life, so uh, that's how they should do life. 
right? I know they need to eat. So, because I eat and I get hungry, they're probably hungry. Let me figure it out. They're crying. I don't know why. When I cry, it's because something's wrong. Okay, let me figure out what's wrong. And they go through life together figuring it out. Most people don't have any training. And the same is true in the church. Most of us don't get any training on how to make disciples. You know what? You know how to make a disciple? I'm reading this book uh, called Discipleship or Disciple Making or something like that by Ralph Moore. And here's what he says. And disciple making is an intentional friendship with Jesus at its core. That's it. Making disciples is about establishing an intentional friendship. In other words, you're, you're saying, I want to be a friend with this person, and I want Jesus to be at the core of it. And so when we get together, I'm going to talk about what God's doing in my life and maybe what God's doing in their life. Maybe he's not doing anything yet, and we can ask him about it and say, hey, have you ever prayed? I don't, this is how I pray. I'm not sure it's right or not, but let's do this together. And so you establish a friendship with Jesus at the core, and that's it. It's that simple. So how many intentional friendships do you have? I wonder. Look, the world is depending on us to get this right. You wonder why the world is falling apart? I'll tell you this. One of the, one of the biggest convictions that I have is as a public, I used to be a public school teacher, and I used to hear people all the time criticize public school. All the time I hear it. I hear it even to this day. And I think, I, I went through this process for many, many years, thinking about ah, private school, public school, homeschool, what do we do? And my, my answer is yes, all of it. And I think you should experience all of it. Our boys have been in public school, they've been in private school, they've been homeschool. Right? And I think whatever works for you is great. But I will say this, let's not criticize the public school system because the reality is the reason that the public school system is the way that it is it really is our fault in many ways you know when we started establishing christian schools to separate from the public schools what do we do we pull christian educators out of the public school system and then we look at the public school system and we go oh man they've taken god out of schools no they haven't we have and I'm the biggest culprit. I mean, our kids go to a private school, right? Right now. But I'm all for public education, and I would love to see more public school, more Christians in the public school system. I think it's very important. I know some of you are doing that, and I think it's great. I want to keep that up. And the same is true with our world. The, the world is depending on us to make a difference, to make an impact, to make disciples. And it's not just something that we think is a good thing to do. It's something God has commanded us to do. Look at Genesis chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, verses 27 to 28. It always starts in Genesis, right? I mean, that's the word of Genesis means beginning, and so it is the beginning. And this is the first commandment that God gives to his people. Do you think it's important? Yeah, very important. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27, and it's one that we quote here a lot. Um, it, it's it's that we were made in the image of God. So it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, the first thing he says to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so what's God's first commandment to his people? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. 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 Grow. And in this case, they multiplied by having kids. And that's a great thing too. But not every one of us can do that. And some of us have already had too many. Right? Like, I think four is enough. Probably one too many. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it was enough. And so, but now we multiply in other ways. We can multiply by making disciples. And this is very important to God. If you flip over to verse, or chapter 8, and so if you know anything about the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, you've got Adam and Eve in the garden, and then they sin and they get kicked out of the garden, and then you have Cain and Abel, and you have all this stuff that happens, and the world becomes wicked, and then God says, you know what, you guys are so wicked, I'm going to destroy it all and start over with Noah. Right? And you put them on an ark, and then they start over. And so after this whole thing with the ark God speaks to Noah in Genesis chapter 8, and he says, Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth 
and be fruitful and multiply the earth. And so here's that command again to Noah, go and multiply. Multiply. Why? He wants to multiply the good stuff. You know, I have, a, I have a yard at home. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I have a yard at home. I have grass. Any of you ever grown grass? I grew up from seed, and so I'm very proud of it. But one of the things that Scripture says is when you grow wheat or whatever, it, it says don't worry about pulling out the bad weeds first, right? Wait until harvest time, and then when you harvest, you can separate the wheat from the chaff. You can separate the, the weeds from the wheat. Um, in the field. And the same is true with grass. I don't know if you've ever grown grass. I grow grass. I love, not that kind of grass. I grow like green grass for my yard. Um, Just want to make that clear. Uh, And so I love it. And I've been watching, I I planted seed. And so, you know, early on when we planted seed, and you saw my yard when we first planted it, there were like all kinds of weeds everywhere. And I was like, ah, do I go and pick the weeds? What do I do? And I remember that verse and I was like, I'm going to hang on to that. I'm going to let it grow and I let it grow. And guess what? Every once in a while I go out and pick a few weeds, but the reality is I just, I fertilize the grass, the good stuff, and the grass grows and it gets strong, and you know what it does? It chokes out the weeds, and the same is true with us. God says, go and multiply yourself. Why? Multiply the good. Multiply the the God-fearing Christians, following God, disciples, Multiply them, and you know what? You'll see the community around you will change, and and where there once were weeds, there will be grass flourishing and green, and it's a beautiful sight when you look at my yard now with all the grass. Now, granted, I have dogs over there now, and so they pee on it, and gets so there's holes all over the place, but it used to be a beautiful thing, (laughs) and it is still a beautiful thing if you look at it like this. It's beautiful and green. And, it, and the, all the weeds have been choked out. Not all of them, but there's still a few here and there. But, but for the most part, it's green and beautiful. And that's what God wants to do with our community. And that's what he tells him in Genesis chapter 8, in Genesis chapter 1, and also in Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 9, 7, he says, And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. So Jesus' command to go and make disciples isn't a new commandment or a new commission. It's an old one. It's actually a reiteration of God's first command. Go and be fruitful and multiply greatly on the earth. Multiply in it. Multiplication is a mandate from God. A mandate. It is a command that we are called to do. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and, and uh, as we close here. Now, I'm going to give you some practical application here, right? Now, one way to multiply God's people on the earth is to have kids, okay? So those of you that are married, I want to encourage you, go and have kids. The more, the merrier, right? Um, but not all of us can do that. And I understand that. And for some of us, that's very painful, right? I can't, I just can't do it. And so there are other options. Adopt. Or just go and make disciples in your community. That's a beautiful thing too. Go and multiply. What we can do is we can make disciples regardless of how we do it. It's really no different than what my friends in Temecula are about to go through, right? With their new baby. We don't have a cute little baby shower every time we make a disciple. Maybe we should. We don't shout, you know, hey, we're having a baby, let's celebrate. Maybe we should. But here's what you can do. As we close with this last song, I want to challenge you. We have a communion table over here, and some of you took communion this morning. That's awesome. You should have a program in front of you and a connect card of some type. If not, just a piece of paper. And I want you to begin praying for three individuals that you can approach about making a disciple. I want to reiterate what I said earlier when I first came up here. I'm so blessed to see you guys here. Um, You know what? One of the things that I love seeing your faces every Sunday. This is a great thing. And last night and Thursday nights and whatnot. One of the things that um, I don't like is when I show up on a Sunday morning and there's no new faces like we're here to reach our community and this time is to usher in the presence of God it really is Um, 
I want, there's people that walk by every, every Sunday that need this. There's people, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers that need this. Would you agree? I know right now you're thinking of two or three individuals that need this, that need to experience the presence of God, that need godly relationships. And so what I want you to do is I want you to write that on a piece of paper and I want to partner with you. And I want you to, as we sing this last song, I want you to bring it to the table and just leave it on the table. Consider this an altar and take those three individuals and bring them to God and leave them at the altar and begin praying. Make a commitment to pray for them. I've made a commitment to pray for you on a regular basis. I have every single one of your names. Let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. I have every single one of your names written down and I pray for you on a regular basis. And I want to continue to pray for you and partner with you by praying for your friends and the people that you know that need Jesus. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor. But during this time, would you write it on a piece of paper and bring it up here and leave it at the altar and we'll begin praying for them. Father, thank you so much for your mandate that really tells us we don't have to do life alone, that we're to do it together. And I pray this morning for those people that don't know you and that need you. That are represented even here in this room as we, as we pray, God. I pray you'd bring them to mind. I pray you'd bring them to our hearts. I pray you'd bring them to this place. Or even some other place where they can get to know you. So go before us even now as we pray working in their hearts and be working in our hearts. Help us to know how to go and make disciples. In Jesus' name.